buonasera, buonasera a tutti, benvenuti, hello, welcome everybody to the Italian Cultural Institute. Uh, tonight we are very, very happy and excited to present this event dedicated to architecture and which will actually open a, a series of seminars called Architecture, Projects, Territory and Relations. Uh, with this title, we tried to include different, uh, different elements, embracing, trying to embrace some fundamental aspects and facets of, a, of an architect's job, or rather a mission, I would say, also. And, um, and of course, with this title, we also tried to trace a program which could reflect the complexity of the matter. Um, the program will unfold throughout uh, this year, and we aspire to touch and investigate these interesting themes. So projects, good practices, territory, and so people and communities, after all with a double focus on two countries, Italy and Norway, of course, sharing and comparing ideas, but also hopefully creating a fruitful and uh, engaging moment and place where we can also debate. So at the end of this uh, lecture, questions will be very, very welcome. Now please, let me introduce our lecturer, Professor Antonello Alici, uh, who is presenting his lecture about the history and the connections between the Italian and Norwegian architectural cultures through the last two centuries. Thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. And uh, he's an architect, of course, architectural critic, PhD, associate professor in history of architecture at uh, Università Politecnica delle Marche in Ancona. His main field of research has been the Nordic countries and especially uh, Finland and Finnish architecture. He has uh, promoted several seminars on the travels of architects north, south and vice versa. Uh, he has published many publications on the team and um, I'm just mentioning the most recent one, uh, his contribution to this uh, enchanting book, enchanting volume, uh, with an article, uh, The Journey to, to the North, the Italian Cultural Institute in Stockholm, in the context of the relationships between Swedish and Italian architects. So thank you again, Antonello, the floor is, is yours, and uh, yeah, uh, as I said, this is the first seminar, uh, uh, the first of a series of seminars. You can find more details about the program mm -hmm. on our website, and the uh, next seminar will be at the end of March, the 30th of March. We are going to, to have some uh, architects talking about a project on the fjord, the Astrup Fernley Museum and the Tupolman Redevelopment. Okay. Thank you, Antonello. Thank you. Thank you, Director, for this kind invitation and for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy, glad to be here. It's a great honor to be in this institute and to be back in Norway and Oslo after a few years. As you, as you heard, um, I work a lot on the mutual connection between Nordic countries and, and Italy. Mainly I have worked on focus on Finland and Sweden, but Norway was also one of my, one of my interests a few years ago. I was helping to organized the exhibition of Snohetta in Rome and also Christian Jarmun, which is, uh, I can say, a friend. Um, and so uh, um, uh, I'm very interested and very, uh, let's say, enthusiastic on the 
capacity of Nordic architects and Nordic culture to interpret their place. My, my lecture will be um, touching some, some points, some questions. Uh, three, three words are roots, connection, and resonances. The two words that we are speaking about are how do I Okay. The two words we are speaking about are in a way opposite, but playing together, having a mutual play uh, between them. I would concentrate on these uh, topics, on these items. Of course, landscape is what is uh, really very important for both countries. Uh, and townscape is what we, uh, in, uh, what we experience also in a capital city, in little villages, and uh, so is also a topic very important. Then light, of course. Light is extremely important to uh, judge the space, architecture. And so the architects use the light as a tool, is one of the material of the, of, the, of the research, of the building, of the construction. And shadow is the other alternative, the other element. And so the two elements are really very important in the reading of architecture and space and, and place, but also in the design of them. Uh, place uh, is uh, a, a key element to recognize a place is a capacity of architect. And there is a, a, a very important uh, architect and the theorician, which is Christian Norbert Schulz, that was a great friend of Italy and a, a really a very important uh, uh, um, a communicator of these elements, he was using a lot the, the term genius loci, which is something uh, very, very important. Then there is the identity. What is the identity? I will try to talk about this because identity is something which is very important to understand. So the place me be, brings with it the idea of identity. And then there is a term Nordic, which is uh, the opposite of Mediterranean a term which today I would like to conclude uh, asking, what is the new Nordic? Is uh, uh, existing a new Nordic? How do we today experience the idea of Nordic? And we could say, I was uh, discussing with the director, we could even say there is a new Mediterranean. For sure, they are there. Um, and this is a selection of books. There are so many, but uh, the travel the traveling architect, the travels of artists, painters, and architects, I can say musicians, etc. This is a, a big, big topic which was uh, started um, uh, 100 years ago or a bit less and became more and more interesting. Uh, and uh, researchers have made a lot of, connect, a lot of uh, uh, researches to collect the results of travels because the travels are. Um, an experience which is translated and then spread in the, uh, on, on the way back from the travel. Uh, and so, um, uh, you see, Christian Romberg Schulz uh, spoke about Nightlands, and then we have other books which are a selection of books talking about the connections between Italy and Nordic countries. And this one, Architect in Viaggio, is a recent research, very important, of colleagues from University of Catania, who gathered a lot of uh, friends and specialists to talk about the travel to Sicily, which is, of course, a main, a main, a main topic. Um, um, I, I would like to start uh, mentioning or, or quoting uh, what is the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has been an exhaustible source of inspiration, a meeting place and a bridge between cultures. The Mediterranean has played a mythical role in the education of artists, architects, uh, and, and, and people of culture, inspiring the long tradition of the Grand Tour. Um, but what is interesting is that Mediterranean is not only important for Northern or Central European. Mediterranean was a theme also important for Italians, for Spanish, for, uh, for French. I quote Carlo Belli, an Italian writer, who said, who wrote, the theme of Mediterraneanness and Greekness was our navigation star. 
we discovered early that a bath in the, Med in the Mediterranean would have restored to us many values drawn under Gothic superimpositions and academic fantasies. Um, why is important this? Because in some key uh, times of, the, of our history, while when architects and, and artists and the culture was seeking for new expressions, Mediterranean and travels uh, uh, and, and these places were a big source of inspiration, directly to the source, without using or copying uh, other, other uh, uh, elements. Uh, and so it was going to, to the truth, uh, going to, to express and to find the truth and the true capacity of expression. Um, and so the travel of architects is uh, uh, um, a, a, a giant, a giant uh, uh, problem or a giant question. I just want to say, what is Italy? Italy was a collection of states, little and big. Italy was invaded by many, many other uh, cultures. And so it was not a united country for long, long centuries. Only after 1860 became one country. But this uh, place was already understood as a unique country by travelers. The travel to, to Italy, to the Mediterranean, is a, 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 growing, a growing story, growing element uh, uh, fr from the mid 17th century and then growing and growing. And the itineraries are, are changing. And changing little states is, uh, was really problematic. It was also dangerous to travel through this complex country. But it's very important to understand that Italy became one culture, one country, one element, through the description of the visitor. So the travelers have a double, a double issue, a double, a double aim, or, or a double result, is to themselves grow and take inspiration, but also to transmit to the local people the importance of their, of their uh, places. Uh, and then Norden, how Christian Norbert Schulz uh, uh, named, the, the big uh, 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 Nordic countries made of uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and, and Finland, uh, and Ireland, um, they were also uh, a, 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 a complex culture. Norbert Schulz says, can we talk about the North as, a, as, a, as one place? Of course not. Of course it has connections, but it's not one place, it has differences. And of course we could go and we will say something about the, the difficult connection between these countries. And so the domination of, 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 uh, of Denmark for a while and then the domination of Sweden, which brought uh, problems to Finland and to Norway to be uh, uh, countries which had to wait to have their original culture. I want to quote, uh, I want to quote Norbert Schulz in the book Nightlands that I showed you, because I think it's rather important to, to follow his uh, capacity. North and South are familiar names. When we use these terms, we think not of cardinal direction, but of domains with, with character and identity. We travel from the north to the south to experience warmth and sun and all that this entails. We travel from the south to the north to, well, this is precisely the question. What is it that we find there? What is, the, is it that distinguishes the Nordic world? And he continues to make a parallel or a, or a difference. Classical architecture presents and maintains the southern world as homogeneous space, as characteristic plasticity, as distinct gestalt. And it is stone that provides its implicit permanence. It is again this background that we must measure the reaction of southerness visiting the north. Here, they, the southern people, encounter a world which is hardly complete, but rather unfinished and fragmentary. Nordic forms of expression are not locally explicable, but must rather be understood as the encounter of the domestic and the imported. As such, comparison with the South is integral to an understanding 
of what lies concealed in the name north. So, uh, south is sun and high, mezzogiorno, stone, classical, monumental. And so we can say symmetry, proportion, rhythm. North is dark and below, the low sky, says uh, Norbert Schuh, settentrione. It is wood, spontaneous, domestic. Uh, home and not piazza in the north. Intimacy and warmth are more important than their representative grandeur. I think that we can use these uh, words of Norbert Schuh as a tool to follow the selection of, of, of slides that I, that I want to <coughs> propose you. Uh, you know that the, the, the Grand Tour started in uh, mid 16th century, 17th century, and this is one route from England to Italy crossing the Alps, or very dangerous with snow, uh, pro probably attacked by people that steal you everything you have and uh, you never know if, you, if your travel continues. And this travel lasted months. And this was a travel always, uh, uh, in the, uh, at the beginning, having special guides to show to the noble young men uh, to uh, the, the places they wanted to know. But then this became the tour of independent artists, etc. Uh, what, what were they looking in Italy? Uh, source of inspiration, eternal source, source of inspiration is the Pantheon. But not only the Pantheon, you see the life of this place. You see the colors, the light, the, the, the people is always in this painting. This collection of paintings were also bought by travelers and they brought back memories like also these paintings. Then another uh, uh, continuous eternal source of inspiration is Villa Adriana in Tivoli the marvelous giant villa of the Emperor Adriano, which was a collection of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, elements, of pure, uh, pure geometrical elements, a play with nature, a play with, with, with the sun, with the lights, statues, uh, um, architecture, etc. Very important, the terme, the vaults, the bath, and this enigmatic place, round place, which is called Maritime Theatre, but we are not sure that it, was a, that, it, that it was that. Anyway, these elements have been in all the booklets, in all the, the sketching books of the main architects, but also uh, described, uh, described by, described, sorry, by, by uh, um, uh, poets, uh, uh, etc. Then the discovery of Herculaneum and Pompeii was a turning point. So from the white antiquity, they discovered antiquity was not at all white, but it was full of colors. And the colors they could experience in this uh, uh, heroic excavation that was attracting all Europe, uh, uh, from this they learned a completely different uh, uh, antiquity. And these are early engra engravings of these beautiful places that are still in our very important itineraries. So classical architecture was the first item, the first uh, thing they were looking for. The main itinerary, which was uh, in, in, uh, uh, organized and, and passed uh, from one generation to the other, uh, a colored antiquity was the discover. And you see also grotesque from the discover of Domus Aurea in Rome. And so they, they, they thought they were caves and all these beautiful uh, drawings, uh, 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 elements, decoration became, were immediately translated all over Europe in the palaces of uh, 19, uh, 18th and 19th century. So the classical architecture became the uh, important, monumental, important translation of this in uh, uh, Central and Northern uh, uh, Europe. I, I like always to show this Panini, uh, a couple of these Panini uh, paintings, which are um, explaining the dream of the collector. I told you that the travelers were bringing back uh, statues, uh, copies, uh, but also they were bringing back a lot of paintings made by artists who were really working uh, as that. So this is the dream of the antique Rome uh, uh, in, in mid 18th century. 
But then, I like also to say that it was not only the antique Rome, but it was also the contemporary Rome. So the Rome of the neoclassical time, the Rome of Baroque time, was also a, a, another dream which was understood at, at that moment. So we should say, uh, travelers to Italy or to the Mediterranean went only to search for antiquities. For a certain time, yes, but then they turned, they changed their itineraries because then they were uh, interested to discover a, a different um, perception, different inspirations to be guided to their architecture, which was not anymore neoclassicism, but was the search for a more dynamic, a modern uh, uh, architecture. And so the Italia became Italia Minore, became uh, smaller itineraries which were going around uh, central Italy, Lazio, Umbria, uh, Tuscany, uh, and, and Marche. Uh, let's go to some names. Berter Torvalsen, the Danish artist, came to Rome for a scholarship of one year and stayed in Rome for 30 years or more. He became one of the most important uh, um, um, artists in Rome. He started to have commissions from many places, not only in Italy, but in Europe. And he became the central person for Nordic artists. So he was the, the man uh, inviting and helping Nordic artists. This is his atelier, which was a really fantastic uh, place with all these statues, partly by him or partly collected. And this collection of elements, so reestablishing the, the antiquity uh, in, with all this element became a very important starting point. Um, we know that in uh, 1830, the Nordic community of artists was the most numerous, was the biggest in Rome. They were, they were establishing the circoli di lettura, reading circles, Danish reading circle, Swedish reading circle, and Norwegian reading circles. And this is a famous painter of a trattoria in Rome, where you see Torvalsen and his colleagues, uh, Danish, and probably not only Danish, were uh, used to, to, to stay. So from this started a very important element. We should uh, work a lot on the archives of the, of, the, of the circle, of the Scandinavian circle in Rome, who was founded before Italy was a united nation, was uh, founded in 1860. So the legacy of this artist is extremely important, is a starting point of our story. You know that then when Torvaldsen went back finally to his country, when he was old, he had from the king the gift. He could build his own museum uh, made by uh, Bindesburg. And this museum, which has these uh, uh, um, Egyptian uh, uh, elements, is anyway a piece of Italy with the choice of colors, with the marble, with, with this uh, pavement in concrete, and with uh, the grotesque, the, 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 the influence of grotesque. And here is a beautiful, all around the building is the, um, all the story of the uh, uh, giant collection of turbots and that was carried on, on, on a boat and brought to, uh, to Copenhagen. So um, uh, this, is, this is the key element. From Torvaldsen on, uh, the, uh, uh, the artist, uh, artist community and architectural community in Italy became important and was growing and growing. But these men, these artists, were also establishing connections in Italy. And this was the starting point for the travel of Italians. I don't have really many. Um, drawings from Norwegian artists. This is a problem because they were probably, they were few, they were probably all uh, um, uh, uh, training in, in Sweden. Um, and so uh, I have a collection of elements by other, uh, by other artists, but I want to show them anyway to you, a few, a little selection uh, from this book of my colleague Fabio Mangone who did many years ago, a, a, a very important research in the archives of the Museums of Architecture of the old Nordic countries. So you see Ro Italia Minore. This is Roma, but not anymore the monumental elements. Or we see that we go 
to Capri, we go to see the landscape. And so this is the importance of light landscape and the importance of going away from, going far from symmetry, for monumentality, and going to spontane sponta spontaneous uh, um, elements and items, which were what the new architects were looking for. They wanted to go far from neoclassicism, and they wanted to find other elements. And they were fascinated and attracted by the capacity of playing with, uh, with, the, with the territory. Uh, Isa Gusta Klaasson, you see the uh, um, uh, details of the interiors of these buildings, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, different seasons of Renaissance, uh, and also the details, the decorations in Pompeii, the colors of Pompeii were, as I told you, very inspiring. And so this was the palette of these architects who were uh, working with watercolors and brought home a lot of uh, inspiration. And also Italian Middle Ages was very, very important uh, for, from Ferdinand Buber, who was a, a very important architect in, uh, in Stockholm, in, uh, in Sweden, as you know. Um, uh, so Italia is not anymore Pantheon, is not anymore Colosseum, but is um, Middle Ages, is uh, little elements, churches, but also you see the layers of, uh, of buildings. So uh, uh, buildings having additions and additions. So the buildings were alive and they are uh, uh, interesting elements. And you see also that the, the way to describe elements is different from watercolors, from more monumental drawings, the, the um, sketch of the architect becomes uh, a sketch with pencil and, and pen. And this is uh, the travel of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Ragnar Oesberg, who is the architect of the town hall of Stockholm, which is uh, really uh, linked to, to Venice. And so you see also Umbria, Assisi, Perugia, uh, and then southern Italy, the coast of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Amalfi, Anacapri, to Sicily, Taormina, Agrigento, again here to the, to the Greek and Roman uh, architecture. But as I told you, what is the opposite? The um, interest from Mediterranean, not only from Italians, of course, to Nordic countries comes from this exchange and from the attraction also, uh, first of all, for the different climate, different landscape, but also to follow the results of the effect of the Grand Tour or of the Tour to Mediterranean. Because this uh, became a collection of very important uh, monuments, buildings all over Northern Europe, which were really uh, um, loved by uh, Italian architects. And so the, um, the travel to the north is completely different. The travel to the north is made by uh, magazines, publication of magazines, uh, uh, Italian journalists or architects coming here, probably not sketching in this beautiful way as the, the, the Nordic could do, but taking photographs and making reports. And so our magazine became from the um, uh, be, uh, from the last decade of 19th century, um, interested more and more into Nordic countries. What, what, what is Norway? What are Nordic countries? They are landscape, they are these uh, fantastic uh, stuff ch churches, they are also uh, little towns in this fantastic, uh, um, in this fantastic uh, landscape uh, made of, of mountains, made of, of sea, uh, and of course this beautiful uh, uh, colors, this beautiful light, which is a special light, is completely different from the Mediterranean light, and it is something that for us is very attractive. And so two, uh, two pictures on, on, on Norwegian landscape, just to, uh, just to say what was for us really extremely important, fascinating. Uh, and I, I go to a selection of names that are rather important. After Torvaldsen, there was a generation of, of artists from, from Norway, which was rather, uh, uh, rather interesting. But then I want just to, uh, so there was Johann Christian Dahl, Thomas Fernley, 
um, Martinus Rerby, but also I want to mention uh, Henrik Ibsen, who was inspired by Italy, worked in Italy and traveled to Italy. So I, I speak about architecture because it's my topic, but of course architects represents a wider, wider cultural scene which is made of painters, writers, also musicians that are inspired in both directions. Um, I want to quote Sigrid Unsen, a, a, a Danish, a, a Norwegian writer. She came to Rome in 1909 and her novel Jenny uh, took place in Rome um, and she was uh, a part of the artistic milieu in Rome. So part of this milieu I was trying to explain before. In Rome she met her husband, Anders Svarstad, and was in Rome a long time and now Rome is planning to make a literary park under her name. So you see the traces of this uh, of these artists are very important, they are uh, really surviving, and they are writing a new history probably on the results of this literature or of this architecture. But I, want, I, I told you already, Norwegian has been, un, uh, Norway has been underestimated and less studied than the other countries for the reasons I told. Um, the Norwegian Institute of Technology in Trondheim which was the first, was founded in 1910, while the others were founded at least 40, 50 years before. And so um, Norwegian architects had to go to study in Stockholm or in Copenhagen. And so the story starts from there. They were pupils of Danish or, or Swedish, uh, or Swedish um, um, uh, professors and architects. And from there, they started their their, their travel. Um, Italian influence in, uh, uh, in, in at the beginning of, uh, of um, 20th century is evident in the, raci in the racing of the so-called uh, Nordic classicism. So we had Nordic ro uh, national romanticism uh, spreading all over the Nordic countries. And then from this, which is a version of Art Nouveau or Jugendstil, and, then, and this was what they were, the results of this uh, uh, Italia Minore, of these uh, uh, smaller tours. And then we have Nordic classicism, which is rather evident in all Nordic countries. Nordic classicism is, was, was uh, uh, a, a phenomenon from the late 1910s to the 1920s. This was providing a really um, uh, delicate and simple classicism, no decorations, but the composition of volumes, uh, symmetry. And it was extremely elegant, completely unknown in, in, uh, in Southern Europe. And so this was a very important item and very important source of inspiration for Italian travelers. And what was extremely important was the surprise all, all over Europe to see Nordic country, which was completely unknown before, entering very strongly in the scene of the modernity, of what they, what we called functionalism or funkis. So functionalism is the expression of uh, modern movement, which was, uh, which was uh, spread in France, Germany, uh, guided by, by Germans and French and, and Dutch. Uh, but what we experience in Nordic countries is completely different. And it is, a, uh, uh, it is something which is uh, spreading from, uh, as a logical continuation of the Nordic classicism. So these buildings that we are now uh, going to see, a few of them, are like, like, uh, like uh, Oslo uh, uh, City Hall. They are really a, 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 a dia they, they provide a dialogue between a classicism. They are imposing, they are <coughs> symmetrical, uh, they are dominant, uh, and they have a rhythm, but they are completely clean. They don't have any uh, decoration, and so they express, in a, a, we can say, an intermediate way. And I want to say that Nordic countries, they have never followed too close the fashions that were spreading all over the rest of Europe. Because probably what, what Norbert Schultz is saying, uh, they had the capacity to mix the international with the local. 
so the local traditions, but also the, uh, to be embedded into such a landscape, to be embedded in this special light, in the seasons which are so strong, so extreme, provided the need to adapt foreign languages to the local culture and local tradition. I think this is a very important element. So, Arnestein uh, Arneberg was a very important figure. He uh, made, uh, he made this, uh, this uh, town hall with Magnus Paulson. Um, he was educated in Stockholm, followed the lectures of Gustav Klaasson. We have seen some pictures of, of him at the Tekniska Oxkola uh, in Stockholm. Then he traveled to Europe, uh, in it, including Italy, in 1907. And again in 1921 and 1953. So three very different Italies. And, um, and so he collected three photographic albums, mainly postcards and photographs, more than, more than, uh, um, than drawings. But Italy in 1907, 21 and 53 was providing completely different architecture. In the 20s, Italy started to have also a rather interesting research in architecture. So what is hidden behind this, what we should describe, but not today, in another conversation, should be how the travelers to Italy in those times were acquainted or were interested not only anymore on old Italy, on traditional Italy, but also on what Italy was doing, what was proposing. Uh, and this became a connecting point. So the dialogue and the mutual travels in the two countries. Uh, and I, I show you some pictures of this imposing a very important building, which is then, uh, um, uh, which is also in the cover of some magazine, as you see. And it is still a dominant element. Of course, the interiors are also extremely important. And of course, it's very natural. So in this way, it's also playing something of national romanticism, because it has a symbolism which is very linked to the, to the place. And here, we have to, uh, we have to uh, uh, consider the importance of international trends and the national uh, elements, which are a tool and, and an important element from the turning point from 19th to 20th century. Then Lars Bakker, a, a great man, a very important figure, who um, was uh, linked to, to Arneberry, and, and he, you see, in, at school he was, of course, uh, uh, going to describe the Italian, um, Italian Renaissance. Palazzo Giustiniani in Padova. And then he was dreaming, he was uh, doing exercise with this swimming pool, you see having a central hall, which is uh, really linked to classical Italy. So I want to say how Nordic classicism is important, how Oslo uh, is, and, and Norway was representing a, 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 um, uh, an interesting interpretation of, of classicism, like this beautiful uh, villa uh, uh, Larsen, uh, uh, 1923, 2025, which has beautiful models, beautiful uh, elements, is really uh, very, very uh, interpreting the uh, classicism in a modern way. And this is even more modern, this cinema, which has this element, which is also linked to some, um, some uh, secession buildings in, uh, in Vienna. And you know that this cinema had some illusionistic element. I would like, I don't, I don't have a photo uh, here, um, but this has a play with the Gunnar Rasplund cinema made in Stockholm in the same year, and the, in the same years. And this is uh, playing with Pompeii, uh, playing with the colored, uh, uh, the colored antiquity. Um, and then, um, you see, from a more classical, a more monumental, symmetrical, we go to this, which is really the funkis, which is uh, dynamic forms, uh, going to spread and to express and to interpret the, 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 the hill uh, dominating the landscape. And so there are so many of these interesting buildings, Kansen restaurant, 
unfortunately demolish and other restaurants. Of course, restaurants, bath, and uh, elements of the, <coughs> this building were the new buildings, the buildings of the modern capital cities. And these architects were completely aware of the importance to change language, to interpret language uh, uh, in this way. So beautiful drawings that are in the collection of the Architecture Museum, some beautiful photos of the interior of very fashionable uh, places of the, of the time. You see also this beautiful entrance, uh, um, monumental but very light, so going to start to use these light elements. And so this is a bridge to one towards functionalism. And I want to say that when all the countries reached functionalism, they left it very soon because they went beyond, they went to find a, a personal interpretation of this, uh, uh, of, of modernity. And the Eckerberg restaurant, uh, again, an el interesting element, look these uh, corners, uh, look into the landscape. So these are architecture, that, these are places that are embedded into the landscape. They are going to look to the, they are going to look to the light uh, they are going to follow the light during the day. They are going to follow the, the, the landscape and, and so face in the water. Um, and we go to a couple of architects who established a, a, an office very successful, Gudolf Blackstad and Hermann Montecas. Uh, this is a sketch by the first of one of his travels, one of the few sketches I, I could find. But this is a very important, very imposing this town hall, which was made by them. And you see also one interpretation of a clean uh, um, classicism with this corner very monumental, but all the rest of the building is very clean. And this is very close to what Asplund does for his library. So a new interpretation of classicism, which, uh, would, um, which was uh, uh, appreciated by, um, by Italians, uh, uh, by, by um, Central and Southern Europeans. So Nordic countries became uh, very, very much published into the, uh, into the uh, international magazines. Uh, and uh, this is the travel of, uh, of architects who publish these elements. I, I think it's very, very interesting, this uh, house of artists, uh, which was a turning point, very important for the artists of the time, also, Munch was fighting to have this place. And this is still a beautiful place. I hope you agree. And this is 29. And so I want to say just a word on the, on the materials. The materials here are, we, we, uh, I, I was saying before, uh, southern Mediterranean is stone, and here is wood. Then it's not anymore wood. It's also granite. It's also brick. And the brick is an important material in Stockholm. In, in, in Oslo, you know it very well. The, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the surface, the, the, the skin of this building is extremely important. But look also this protruding element, which is playing with modernity. So the building is completely closed outside because the light comes from the, from the skylights, but also the basement is completely transparent. And so interpreting the new idea of uh, uh, functionalism, of, architect of modern architecture, which has to use uh, uh, glass and, uh, and windows. And this is also a very successful building uh, going to the, the cover of important magazines. I go towards the end um, presenting you some Italian magazines. These are pioneering magazines you see from the end of 19th century, which are representing Art Nouveau, as you see from, the, from the, the expression of these pages. Well, they were following uh, international architecture, and they were starting publishing uh, uh, Nordic uh, architecture. Vittorio Pica is an important, uh, important man of this story, but Marcello Piacentini was the architect who was most uh, close to, to Mussolini, uh, and he was uh, um, experiencing and uh, working a lot on, uh, um, uh, on Scandinavian architecture, publishing a book with a selection of buildings. And he was amazed 
by the quality of architecture, by the quality of the space, the quality of the light, etc. Then I go to a very to a key figure, which is Giuseppe Pagano, the director of the important uh, um, uh, magazine Casabella, who was uh, invited as he was fighting for modernity, he was invited to the four Nordic capitals in January 1939 and gave a lecture which was called, uh, a lecture given in German because it was the common language, uh, the, a lecture on modern Italian architecture. This was also the way to establish a new co connection with Nordic architects. And so he was then publishing a lot on uh, uh, Nordic uh, architecture. I want to quote now a, a figure that uh, is uh, well known, Ivo Pannaggi. There is here somebody that uh, should give again a lecture on Ivo Pannaggi. Ivo Pannaggi uh, was an architect from Marche um, coming in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Norway, moving in Norway in 1942. He was a futurist, but also then a constructivist and neoplasticist, uh, was a painter and an architect. And he wrote this article in 1935, uh, touching one element. This is a, 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 a description of the capitals of the north, and this is Oslo. And you see from the pictures that he's making comparison between the old Oslo which is uh, in very bad condition, very poor city, and the modernity of the shining new buildings which represent the modernity. And you see that he is uh, putting some uh, uh, new, new elements. But he's saying something that is rather important. He's uh, saying this new architecture are just put without any connection with the place. Uh, and this is genius Loki. So this is something we, sh we should uh, discuss. Uh, in Italy, it's completely different. We had a culture that was avoiding this uh, 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 dramatic uh, connection. And so probably genius Loki is different here and there. Or there was no attention. There was just a way to uh, put new buildings into a scene we should, uh, which had to be uh, uh, in fact, uh, prepared for that. Uh, and so this article is very, very critical um, uh, uh, about that. And, and this is probably a, an interesting uh, point of view uh, which was uh, reported to Italians. Italians were looking to the modernity. And here, Giuseppe Pagano, the man I shown you before, is doing just the opposite, saying, while we in Italy during the terrible time, 1940, is the most dramatic time when the war has started, when Mussolini and Italian regime was pushing away modernity. And the architects were discovering and proposing a modernity, which was a fake modernity, which was a neo-neo classicism, saying we are Roma, we want to be the third Rome. And so we continue directly from the old Rome to the new Rome. He said, why all these architects are discussing of void elements, of nonsense elements, and they are just making discourses on which kind of style we should use. Uh, in Norway, we show, we, we see what is very clear. This play with the landscape is really uh, a, a something to follow. It's very simple. It's uh, uh, the way to be real, to, give, to, to, to say the truth and to have the capacity of playing with landscape in a way saying that also Italy one day was able to do that. And uh, you see Lars Bakker was a hero for Italy. There was a, a number of the magazine Domus. Lars Bakker, uh, architect, a pioneer of mo mo uh, uh, Norwegian modernism, was an exhibition which was uh, transferred in, uh, in Italy, and he had a great success. And you see this beautiful, typical watercolor of uh, using the expression of uh, um, modernism, of, of functionalism. Of course, the new modern cars people wearing in the modern way. This was all the, uh, all, all the scene was perfect for the time. Um, allow me, and, and excuse me if I jump uh, of some, uh, some decades just to 
to not to uh, ask too much of your time, because we go to Sverre Fenn, who is really a very known, very celebrated um, Norwegian architect, having many connections with Italy, and uh, uh, his travels to Italy is really very rich. Here is a Brunelleschi sketch, and here is Palladio <coughs> with Villa Rotonda. So the influence of Italy is very important uh, for him, and he had a really big result in Venezia, which is very close to Vicenza. And here you see watercolors, a Italia Minore, a just one, uh, one anonymous street, and here a Renaissance uh, a beautiful element. You see with this watercolor, which is really giving only sensations, only elements to, to inspire. And he was uh, uh, succeeding to interpret the Nordic light, the Nordic landscape, the Nordic spirit in Venice. So making this fantastic building, which is today, every day, this is a surprise for us to see how uh, how concrete, which we can say is a cold material, how concrete can be really so uh, plain so well with Venetian, uh, with Venetian uh, landscape. Uh, and so this is, the, uh, in a way, the celebration of Nordic uh, landscape, of Nordic, uh, um, or Nordic capacity. You see the trees that are going across the, the roof this is something which is really very advanced, very modern, to just respect the nature. And you see uh, all, all the pictures you do are extremely important. This is just a roof that covers a, a completely uh, um, uh, open space, which is uh, opening and playing with the light in different, uh, in different uh, ways. Zverefen was uh, studied by, uh, there is this important book on the collection of Electa, uh, Italian, Italian publisher. Uh, Christian Norbert Schulz was, uh, uh, was doing this with Gennaro Postiglione, who is an, it an Italian professor who had a long season of research in Oslo and in, in Norway. So he was also one interpret of, Nor of Norwegian architecture into Italy. And this book is the uh, result. I close now um, with a question. Uh, in uh, 2012, in Louisiana, there was this exhibition, uh, a new Nordic identity, talking about uh, new Nordic and saying and, and uh, inviting um, architects from the four uh, Nordic countries to uh, play with this question. Um, the, the, the architects were Studio Granda, Iceland, Johan Selsing, Sweden, Jarmut Bignes, um, Norway, um, Lassila, Hirvilammi, Finland, and Lunger and Tramberg, Denmark. Uh, five excellent, important architects who were, to whom was asked to interpret the new identity of, of, of Nordic countries. And I show you a few of these pavilions. This is the Norwegian. This is the Danish by Lunger and Tramberg. Uh, and what they, they were saying, I quote, because this is an open question for us, and I really would like to continue to research this and to understand. I was uh, really lucky to come to Oslo uh, one day before, so I could make a long tour in Oslo and um, remembering places and see how the town is, uh, uh, has changed, uh, and how the town is playing with water, is playing with his hills, how uh, bricks are shining in different uh, way on the, tradition, on, on, the, uh, on the buildings of 20th century. I, I quote the question of this exhibition. Is there a Nordic identity? Does the Nordic way exist? Can one, despite the tendency of globalization um, to uh, erase national and cultural differences, still understand identity as something that is associated with particular places? And if that is the case, how has Nordic identity developed alongside the development of the rest of the world? Uh, 
I think uh, these are really open questions. And uh, um, I think these identities pale is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is not so shining anymore. But this is the globalization. This is the international scene. Uh, and I think a few countries still have uh, um, a local identity. Also because now uh, architecture offices, they are much more international. They play everywhere. And probably foreign artists are, are, are building in, uh, in Oslo, as you see also here. So I leave you with three pictures. Very, very um, successful opera house that they invite you to walk on the roof. And I think that they succeeded. In Italy, it would never be possible for security. Italian moms would be, would be much, much scared of their going to skate on that place. But this is, today, still a successful place. So the capacity to play with water, to play with light, this house is really, um, on my opinion, expressing still a Nordic identity. I am very skeptical with the, this other one, which is, which is anyway not, is not made but. But is really, I'm very sorry to say, Munch is really a beautiful content inside. But this is really something not so interesting. But I was very interested by this, uh, this uh, new housing area, which is really extremely alive and uh, giving, and you see, the pictures are not, this is not a film. They are not invited there to play a film. This is reality. So people is enjoying, it's full of restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, so I think uh, we should discuss this element. It, it, there is still, this is genius Loki, on my opinion. The capacity to interpret the site, which is not the same thing with this or with this, uh, uh, with architecture, which is very international having not the capacity to say something and to, be, uh, to have an identity to be, to be a landmark. I think this um, neighborhood will also become old in a beautiful way, will become, will become a, a good, uh, uh, also the way to play with water. So let's hope that this is the, this is the way and not the international. Uh, thank you. I was in time. I was Perfect. not taking in too time. much time. Great Norwegian, uh, Norwegian and Italian uh, um, guest. So thank you. It was complete, rich, extremely informative. Thank you so much for this travel. And um, uh, I, I think it, the, the last question that you asked was very interesting. It's about identity. It's about how uh, we are perceived, Italians here and Norwegians uh, abroad. Uh, I, I'm just adding a personal consideration. I've been here for just uh, six months, uh, months coming from Italy, and what impressed me a lot was exactly that. So finding so many uh, places, also cultural places, welcoming people. And there are many, many corners that have many functions. They are multi-functioning places. So you can walk on the roof of the, an opera house. Mm -hmm. You can have a, a coffee in a museum or just a lunch in a museum. You can experience places. And places are extremely welcoming. And welcoming is not a word that you would, I mean, uh, traditionally connect to uh, a Nordic uh, country. This is the perception, maybe it's a cliche, of course it is a cliche, but it's the perception that Mediterranean could have of uh, Nordic spaces and Nordic, Nordic urban places. So this question about identity, I think it's very, it's very stimulating and it's also interesting to maybe further discuss how Mediterranean uh, uh, characteristics and um, uh, peculiarities are perceived here. 
and that's a question that maybe you <coughs> can answer. Uh, yeah. So uh, if you want, you can just ask more questions to Professor Alici, and then we are having a little reception, so maybe we can also talk about this. When you mentioned the, what do you call it, the light and the dark, the things that are considered an architecture. I'm not Norwegian, but my impression is that the biggest factor for architecture, certainly in the past, was heat. Okay, so you couldn't build in stone. Norway has lots of stone. You had to be, you preferred to build in wood, it was warmer. So then you have the, wo the wooden houses with the small windows to keep in the heat, and also as part of the architecture in this old style, you need a fireplace, and then you have to have a chimney. So that is the older stuff. Then when electricity comes, boom, change in the architecture. And then to me, the, the what is it called? Another big change is the invention of the double pane glass, mm -hmm. which means poof, mm -hmm. now you can have light without losing heat. Mm -hmm. So that to, to me that would be uh, if I were an architecture, I would study the influence of the double pane window. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if I have to repeat. It's very long. I have to repeat. Yeah, the, que the question anyway is, uh, is linked to the, to the site and so to the need to, keep, to, to build warm places. And of course, this is a central topic uh, because architecture was influenced by this in different climates. So some climates, they need to breathe and so they need to open places. In Nordic countries, you, or in the Alps in Italy, you need to have thick places, and so the wood is, the thick wood is the very important element, and you, have, you must have very little windows, you must heat all these places. So, of course, this became a character. I, I should say something more. The Nordic towns and villages, they are completely different from Mediterraneans, because they had to, they were burning and burning, and so they had to follow regulations. And so we can have historical uh, centers in Italy which are 1,000 years old, here much less. And this is the same question, is that the climate and the danger of, of a certain kind of construction uh, change, uh, um, was uh, changing the regulations. And this shaped the cities in a, in a different way. So this is, this is part of the identity. And when modernism come, uh, in Nordic country probably they are very clever to understand that flat roof is not the best. And so they find also a solution to play with this element. So just not going to follow the, the fashion and try to, and, and uh, I was impressed when I was starting to travel uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in here that you had three triple windows. So you had two windows and one has a double, a double glass. And so this was a way for modernity. And I must say the capacity, the technology of, of these areas are much more developed and they were advanced and advanced. So when technology arrives, when modernity and arrives, uh, these countries are leading these elements because this is a need for them. Uh, and so th this, of course, change the architecture during the times.